Welcome to the first episode of Quanta Talks, a podcast from Quanta, part of QCS Staffing. I'm Faye and I work within the marketing team here at Quanta. I'll be talking to a range of guests from our team here and external experts from our industries, life sciences, renewable energy, data centers, and IT. Today, I'm speaking to Peter Thorogood. Pete has worked at Quanta for five years and is the Orsted account manager within our energy team. In today's chat, we focus on the USA offshore market, the reason why we will be seeing a rapid growth in wind farms stateside and the search for skilled professionals. So without further ado, enjoy our first episode. Thanks for joining me today. Tell us a bit about yourself. Yes, as as you already mentioned, my name's Peter. Uh, I head up the Orsted Global account here for Quanta. I've been with the business for nearly five years, uh, worked within our life sciences department before moving across to support the renewable energies team in their global expansion. And you're working a lot on the USA projects at the moment. Why are we seeing such an increase in offshore wind projects in the USA? Well, I think for, for most people, especially not only in the recruitment industry, but in most industries, the USA is always seen as like this, uh, this shining um, shiny piece of interest. Everyone really wants to go. Everyone finds it exciting. There's so much there available as America markets itself. Um, but I think within the offshore wind farm, the re- industry, the reason we have focused on it, especially in the US, it's a market where there's huge potential for growth. Huge, huge potential. Um, I mean, if you look at Europe and Asia, they've really dominated the market for offshore wind projects for a long time now. And I think the US have really realized uh, they need to play catch up. It's as simple as that. I mean, for some context, the UK, China and Germany together actually accounted for 79% of the 35.3 gigawatts of offshore wind generating capacity installed worldwide. That was as of 2020. Since then, multiple projects have taken place, have implemented more. So that number has increased quite significantly. Uh, And it's only always going to. It's only going to. We know of multiple projects in those areas. Why is there a rapid increase? Well, actually, the people that we need to thank for this um, within the industry for this growth is actually the Biden-Harris administration. Um, Their ambitious plans have caused a rapid scale-up of leasing for offshore wind projects along the Atlantic, Gulf and Pacific coasts. So the Biden administration, they aim to have 30 gigawatts of offshore wind operating by 2030. So you can see that's very close to the number that the UK, China and Germany have all together. Um, so today the US only really has a fraction of that, which is just 42 megawatts uh, of offshore wind from five turbines just off Rhode Island and two off the coast of Virginia. Right. So, I mean, how many wind farms does that look like? In the early stages, um, we, we've got a number of our contractors on multiple projects um, across the East Coast. Currently, we've got mapped out around seven where there are active amounts of recruitment going on, there's active work, that may be people from the UK that are helping support these projects, um, people from Denmark or the head office are supporting these projects. Um, but we also are aware that we have mapped out around 30 plus projects where there are very, very early stages of planning, um, very early stage of bids and tenders, etc. So it's to get to that 30 gigawatt capacity, they are really going to need to step up. So we're looking easily into the double figures. Wow, that's a lot. Um, I mean, due to, so obviously there is a rapid increase and there seems there's going to be a lot of activity there. What's the demand like for the skilled contractors? Oh, the, the demand will be huge. It's going to be huge um, for US contractors due to, like I said, the, the ever-increasing number of projects in the pipeline. Uh, companies are investing lots of capital into projects in the US and we've already placed a number of candidates onto these projects ourselves this year in senior positions. So you can see already they're looking at the resources available, not only just within the US, but out for outside of the US as well. Because they really need these skilled contractors to come in and lead from the front. Um, also, when looking at that increase for, the, well, the increase in demand for these skilled contractors, you've not only got what we class as the white collar work, you've also got the blue collar work. Um, these guys, they'll have also have actually just signed an agreement with the unions to help upskill union workers and then train these guys and actually at least then create jobs for those who are already living in America. So it's not just the professionals outside, 
they're trying to grow the industry from multiple different angles, so really investing into it. So that's going to really see a huge, huge increase in the demand for professionals within that industry. Yeah, that sounds like good opportunities as well with um, training people up and possibly, you know, bringing in more jobs. It does, it does. And I, th I think that's very much key in the American society. Um, we, we saw it before the, the, the need and the want from the public um, during the Trump administration for jobs to be created for those living within America and not bringing that skill set in. So it's going to create a lot of new opportunities for them as well. Um, but as it's an industry fairly much in its infancy, you can see anyone coming into that industry now starts getting upskilled as well. There's opportunity for them to rap rapidly progress through the ranks. Um, and who doesn't like to learn new things and actually really invest themselves and grow their career? I think it's something that everyone wants to do. Everyone wants the opportunity. So I, I think it's... Um, for those living in America, uh, US citizens, it's going to be fantastic for them. Something new and something that's going to be beneficial to them. So it's focusing on that renewable energy piece as well. So it's all for all for good reason. So you mentioned, like obviously it's in its infancy really in the US, um, the offshore wind industry. So as the demand is going to be high for skilled workers, are are they being pulled in from other industries? Are we seeing people take a switch in industry? We have, yes. I mean, we've seen it previously. Uh, anyone has been in any form of uh, recruitment or even in a, a hiring capacity, this always happens. You always see people that do have transferable skills um, from one to another, but they are much more matched in terms of that skill set, especially when looking at like, the life sciences industry, for example, uh, with all the regulations. Now, look into renewable energies, um, with offshore wind, the the requirements are quite specific, especially working offshore. I don't think the people people realise um, the risk that people put themselves at working offshore. Um, but also, again, the regulations, how strict you need to be with your work and how everything has to be perfect down to the minute detail. Um, we have been speaking to a number of hiring managers out in the US, um, been speaking to a number of project leads. One, they are open to seeing candidates from the oil and gas industry. There could be transferable skills there because they've got a foundation already instilled in them. So that's where we can kind of see that they'll be open to taking people from other industries um, because they're going to need to. They haven't got people that have got offshore wind industry experience um, to maybe the capacity they need for this huge ramp up. So are contractors who are not US citizens considered for these roles and what does the process look like? Uh, this is probably currently TBC, uh, as most companies want to make sure they are offering the opportunities to US citizens first and foremost, uh, and they want to make sure they're upskilling the, the current local workforce really to provide longevity within the industry. Um, if we start bringing people from elsewhere on temporary visas, etc., it may mean that the, the long-term ramifications mean that these candidates might move, might leave, uh, and, and leave the US. So they want to make sure they're really instilling that that workforce for the future. Um, with our presence in America, we will be able to support local workers as well in getting these opportunities. So that's very much key for us. We do have our offices in the States, so we can support that local workforce with these opportunities as well. Um, but the workforce coming outside of the US, uh, that's very much down to the individual circumstances and individual opportunity, I would say, right now. Okay, so what would... What would that mean for contractors outside the US if they wanted to get involved? If they wanted to get involved, obviously this is that focuses then on visas and sponsorships. So this would highly likely be down to the individual company. Um, and if they want to engage in that process, I mean, there are certain parameters to be met, very much similar to those in the reverse scenario, if a, a US citizen wants to come and work here in the UK. Um, the easy ones are for those, I would say, are the intra-company transfers. So you're looking at the L1A and the L1B visas. Um, these are something where also can then utilise their current workforce and other offices um, to then go and work on their sites in the US. So it's an intercompany transfer, essentially. Uh, it's not just as simple as going, well, I'm going to go work over there for, for 90 days. Um, there's also uh, the H1B visa for Speciality occupation workers, again, it's th that comes down to very much is the, is the consultant or, or the professional bringing in a skill set into the country 
that they are unable to find or provide within that country. Again, that's very, very um, thin on the details. I do appreciate that, but there's a scoring system, application process for the clients to make sure that they have the right to get these visas and the sponsorships. Um, so it's not to say it's not available. It's just not a simple process as any of us would like. Um, but it is going to be something, hopefully, in the future that we can focus upon. As I said earlier, with, with the skill set of these offshore workers being very thin on the ground and in the early stages in the States, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some of the senior level people come over, maybe your, your managers, supervisors, that sort of level, um, or at least some of very much of a senior engineer hands-on capacity when you look at your niche roles that focus on maybe a senior authorised person or a SCADA professional as well. You may see opportunities for those there. Um, we will know very soon what that landscape looks like. Um, so hopefully by the end of this year we can get a real strong idea of what skill sets are going to be available um, and we can also help educate these clients um, and as well as I'm helping to educate Orsted on on how we can approach this, because it, like I said, it's going to be something where candidates are going to see the appeal of America, new area, new projects, um, from start to finish as well, so they can really sink their teeth into the, these juicy projects. So there'll be a lot of opportunities, I guess. Yeah, so. the, the horizon for for the offshore industry in America is looking really good. Um, it's going to be something where I, I can see the demand really really ramping up when we, we do get candidates a lot of the time that speak to us um, that do ask about the America projects as I mentioned we've got a lot of managers that are working on these projects so they will again will have their favoured workforces um, people they trust skilled professionals that they've met in their network but again we all be very interested it's, it's an industry where people do have an interest in it um, it's not just a job for some people they really are focused on supporting the industry, growing it and sort of being a part of it. So I can see them wanting to try and get these opportunities. But um, as it stands, uh, we will be focused on the local US market uh, and any senior appointments from outside. But we'll be dealing with our clients as I'll be dealing with Orsted with that. Yeah, it's obviously a really important industry to get involved with. So once obviously we've got the contractors and people have started working how on the projects, how long would you say does the average offshore wind project take from the initial phase to the commission? And have we got any at the moment that are ready to go? Have they, have they commissioned any? This is always a tricky question to answer, to be honest. Um, with a lot of projects in this industry, there's inevitably always going to be delays. Um, so to answer one of the parts of the question, yes, there is one operational wind farm. Uh, it's called Block Island. It has five turbines currently. Uh, just off the coast of Rhode Island. Uh, with the others, yes, they are in construction phases, um, but we know there's plenty of things that can disrupt these timelines. So you've got geographical implications. So they have to take into account how it's going to affect the wildlife. Is the seabed fit for foundations? Um, in terms of laying the cables as well, you have a lot of work to be done there. The rock dumping, for example, laying the cables, making sure that the making sure that the cable protection systems work once they're there as well, so that could make delays if any of that gets damaged. Um, also, we have to take into account weather conditions. For the health and safety of the workers, it's very difficult to take them offshore during horrible thunderstorms, for example, or choppy waters where it is endangering them. That's why these guys will have very high-level insurances as well. Um, so taking those into account... Um, like I said, always going to be delays. Uh, we've seen it on a number of projects, especially here in the UK. Um, look at Hornsey 1, Hornsey 2. Um, you look at Race Bank, Westermost Rough. We've seen plenty of um, plenty of delays. I say it's inevitable. Um, but I would say the expectancy really is sort of five years plus from the very early stage to getting it sort of completed, commissioned, and fit for purpose. Um, again, that's a very, very, very rough estimate. Um, I'm sure there might be some people that would disagree, um, but I think from the, the information that we've had working for Austin for 10 years now, um, since they were called Dong Energy, we, we've got a good sort of knowledge base of this. So yeah, five years, I'm, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Confident man. How fast would you say technology is moving within the industry? They're ramping up the projects and things are moving quite fast over there and obviously the rest of the globe as well. So there must be new technology developing all the time? 
Yeah, it's like with any industry, really. Technology, as you would expect, it's ever moving forward with advance, advancements being... Wind turbines continue to grow in size and power. So the average nameplate capacity of newly installed wind turbines at 2.75 megawatts is actually up 8% from 2019. And ridic ridiculously, 284% since 98-99 as well. Um, so you can, you can see... Even there, th those numbers speak for themselves. So we know we're in a world now where t technology advances almost by the day. Um, so I, I would expect this to continue um, for all these wind turbines to get much bigger, better, stronger. That's what we would expect moving forward. Wow. So, yeah, that is moving fast. I mean, is there any new trends coming to the industry? Well, funny you should say that, I'd say over the last sort of 12, 24 months, there has been a couple of new ones that are sort of focused within the industry that we have seen pop up. Um, there has been an increased interest in using offshore winds actually to produce clean hydrogen. Now, we are aware of some of those projects that are in very, very, very early stages um, to the point where bids haven't really even been submitted yet. Um, but that to the public, um, to the working industry as well. Um, I mean, also, you've got the, the global pipeline for floating offshore wind energy has also more than tripled uh, in 2020 to near 27,000 megawatts as well. So, yeah, th there is definitely a few new trends. I mean, there is only so many avenues that we can take in this industry, but to see those areas popping up as well, even for those skilled workers that have been in the industry for a number of years, there's more avenues for them to grow, more avenues for them to learn, which is really, really good to see. I think another point that's good to make is that with the size of the wind farms as well, um, like I said, Block Island, five turbines, as opposed to others that will have hundreds. Um, so only does that equate to making the timelines longer, but they're different wind turbines as well. Companies such as Siemens, such as Vestas, they are all making newer, bigger ones with newer technology. Some that may have new battery storage systems in them as well, which again, open up more doors for those maybe with electrical bias as well. So then you think about it, that's another, that's another skill set that can come into the industry. And the more skill sets from outside of offshore wind that they bring in and upskill, it's going to bring more knowledge base into the business. So yeah, I would say it's going to be a very exciting time. New technologies, new projects, um, new opportunities for everyone. Yeah, I guess the more, more um, the technology moves forward, then it's more opportunities for everybody. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and that's, from, that's from every standpoint. That's from the clients as well, more opportunities for them to grow as a business. From the contractors, more opportunities for them to learn and grow. For us as Business Quanta, more opportunities for us to help and support our clients on, um, on a bigger basis. Um, we've already got proven success out in the States, as well as numerous countries across the globe. So, yeah. Everything's looking very bright for everyone involved. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Faye. Thanks, Peter, for today's chat. We hope you found this insightful. If you'd like to know more about getting involved with these projects, or if you just have some questions for Pete, I put his contact details in the description of the podcast so you can reach out to him. Also, if you'd like to get involved in any future podcasts, I've included the marketing team's details too.